Welcome everyone to Business and Life Stories with James and Mike. Super, super excited this week. Paige Arnoff Fenn is with us. Some of you of a certain age like me know who she is. Some of you young ones might not have heard of her yet. She was the number two marketing person at Coca-Cola amongst many other superior accomplishments. Since 2002, she's been running a global marketing firm called Mavens and Moguls. If you have not heard of this, you need to know about it. Welcome, Paige. Well, thanks for having me, Mike and James. I'm thrilled to be here. So what was your journey like? So it was a crazy, circuitous route. Um, I think Steve Jobs was right. You know, things only make sense looking backwards and connecting the dots. So when I was a student, um, I really thought I would have a very corporate career. My dad and both my grandfathers were commercial bankers. And so I thought I would get into banking because that was kind of our family business. I was an economics major in college. I went back and got an MBA. Uh, but after I graduated from, uh, from college, I went to Wall Street for two years. Um, and like I said, I thought I was gonna have a career in finance. But I, I made a lot of money. And I had fun, but I didn't love the work. So when I went back for my MBA, I kind of rebranded myself to be a marketing person. I did really well in the marketing classes and I got a summer internship at Procter & Gamble, which is kind of the mecca of marketing. Um, it's a, the largest, I think, consumer products packaged goods company in the world. And they invented the concept of brand management. Every category they compete in, I think they're the number one and maybe also number two in that category. So you're talking Tide detergent, Crest toothpaste, Pampers diapers, um, Charmin toilet paper, Bounty paper towels, Pantene shampoo. I mean, every category, they're just su superior. And so I started in brand management there as a summer intern and went back for about three years after business school. So I was really on a more corporate path. So the first chapter of my career was very blue chip, very Fortune 500. Um, after P&G, I worked at Coca-Cola. As Mike mentioned, I was the assistant chief marketing officer there. Coke is the most recognized brand in the world. So, you know, that was kind of the pinnacle of my kind of corporate career. But in the mid to late 90s, the internet started taking off and I got bitten by the dot-com bug. And I, I kind of started a new chapter uh, in startups and I became the chief marketing officer at three startups, one in Los Angeles, two in Boston. And all three of them had go really good rides. We raised a lot of money and they all either went public or were bought um, or both. So that was kind of the second chapter of my career in more startup, small businesses. And then about 20 years ago, right after 9-11, I started my own firm and hung out a shingle and we do branding and marketing. And so now I'm more of an entrepreneur. So um, like I said, I this is not the path I thought I was gonna be on, but um, I had great chapters leading up to this but I love running a marketing business and I'm having a ball. Excellent. Well, as regular listeners know, James is our marketing guy that lives, eats, breathes, and sleeps marketing. So James, take it away, will you? I mean, uh, I am so excited, first of all, um, to be able Me to too. ask you a couple of questions, Paige, and have you on this show. I'm super humbled, super grateful, and it's an absolute honor. Um, I guess uh, my pre-question to my first question is, I, I guess w w with that path, with that journey, um, what do you think the insights or the benefits for you ending up running your own consultancy had by working in the 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 bigger multinationals and then and the, and then obviously moving to the much more lean and agile uh, early dot com um, startups. I mean, uh, what have you gained from from either one or those or by combining the the insights and the 
use of budgets and uh, and uh, uh, and the way the two very different sort of sections of companies move in the marketing space and what so did you bring to your own consulting <clears throat> it's a gr it's a great question so starting with a big you know global business um you know like again i started my career in the 80s and 90s and big companies invested a lot into their talent so companies like P&G and Coke had a commitment to professional development. P&G is a promote from within organization. The only way to get into it is you start at the bottom and work your way up. Or if they acquire a company, you can come in that way. But they don't hire people at mid-career or senior level people. The culture is very strong there. So I feel very fortunate to have started my marketing career at two companies that really invest so much in their human capital. You do a lot of training and development at every stage of your career. And that's, you know, especially since the startups and, you know, the world has become more virtual and hybrid. I think that's such, it was such a luxury because, you know, even though I, I got an MBA, um, when I worked at p and I, I joked that it was like getting a PhD in marketing and working at Coca-Cola for the chief marketing officer, who was a legend in marketing. He did both new Coke and diet Coke. So the biggest success and the biggest failure ever in consumer products marketing. And I call that my postdoctorate. So I really feel like it was continuing education. And I feel very, very fortunate that, um, you know, I worked for companies that really taught me the basics. You learn all the parts of the marketing mix. You learn about packaging, you learn about pricing, you learn about just, I mean, everything, you know, you talk about the P's and the C's and marketing. You live every, you know, you manage the media budget, you, you know, you do every part of the marketing mix. So that was a really awesome foundation, having started at the bottom because you literally know every piece of the business kind of inside and out. So when I joined my first startup in Los Angeles, oh, and the other great thing about working for big companies, you have big budgets. P&G and Coke, mm -hmm. they can afford to run ads at the Super Bowl, at the Olympics. You know, every brand I worked on had tens of millions of dollars of budget. So that was, again, a huge luxury. When I got bitten by the dot-com bug and I joined the first startup in Los Angeles, um, you know, there was no training and development budget. And I was one of the oldest people at the company. I, the two guys who founded the company were younger than me. It was a technology-driven business. Everybody that worked for me was young and none of them had a corporate background. So I was kind of, you know, I used to, in in the corporate environment i was the young renegade challenging the system and questioning everything but at the startup i was like the old lady all these people thought i was yeah. like corporate and i had had this like career at big companies so compared to them i was kind of the establishment which is funny um but you know at, at p and g and coke if you want to do market research everything has uh, uh, you know, you fill out a form, you have multiple uh, steps you have to take. It takes a long time. It can take six, nine, 12 months to field research. It's usually statistically significant. You have huge budgets. It takes a lot of time. In startups, you don't have the luxury of time or money. Everything has to be done very quick, on the cheap. You know, you you test, you learn, you pivot. So I got very good in that startup chapter at being very scrappy, very uh, resourceful, and very quick because you don't you you know everything's on kind of small business internet time, and you know if you wait six or twelve months to do research for an internet company, that's like a whole different millennium mm -hmm. i mean mm -hmm. you, you would be so far behind the curve so you know as as i said you know on the on the corporate side 
when we wanted to learn about our audience, we would send out surveys, we would do focus groups, and we'd do it over, you know, months. And we do it in different geographies and everything took forever. When I worked for the startup in, in Los Angeles, in Santa Monica, we were five blocks from the ocean and there was a promenade next to the beach. And that was our target audience. And we would come in in the morning, we would grab our coffee, take over a conference room, come up with a bunch of ideas of things we wanted to test and learn that we needed some, some consumer reaction to. We'd mock up samples. And by lunchtime, we'd be stationed all over the promenade with clipboards and we'd intercept anybody that looked like they were part of our target audience, 18 to 24, you know, young, maybe skateboarding, maybe tattoos, maybe piercings. And we'd say, hey, we've got some CDs we'll give you. Will you spend a few minutes and answer some questions? And they loved it. Sure, I'll talk to you. And we'd ask them a bunch of questions. After the lunch hour, we'd all meet back in the conference room. We'd tally up our votes. And by the time we left that night, we would put all the everything we learned and heard, which banner ads, which packaging, you know, which copy. The website, we would get everything up on the website before we went home at night. We'd come back in the morning, grab our coffee, get back in the conference room, and we could read in real time how many clicks, you know, what which which packaging got the, the most sales, which mm. banner ads got more people to click through. And so we were iterating in real time, and then we'd start the process again, and we'd do it the next day. And so you're you're very scrappy. You you tweak, you listen, and you learn. So guerrilla marketing is the name of the game. And I'm so grateful I had all the training and development so that I understood the background. But that mm -hmm. lets you have the confidence to know that you can be really quick and dirty and you know where to take shortcuts and you know what's important and why it's important. And my clients now are much more like I was in my scrappy uh, startup days. They're not going to spend tens of millions of dollars on on marketing. They're going to be very, you know, very strategic. And that makes it really fun because, you know, I, I always say you can be lazy when you have big budgets. You can throw a lot of stuff against the wall and see what sticks. You don't have that luxury with startups and, and scrappy budgets. You have to constantly be tweaking and pivoting and learning and incorporating everything you learn into the next iteration. Uh, I mean, that is such a fantastic story there uh, 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 and a transition. Um, I, I guess it sounds though that still featuring within your consultancy nowadays that recommendation for speed of implementation testing pivoting data collection in, in quite a short time frame um are you finding that the clients and the companies you are working with is that what they're already doing and you're sort of tweaking their approach or is it a little bit alien are, are, are people sort of more uh they that they, they obviously haven't got a big budget but is the concept of guerrilla scrappy marketing is that still sort of a semi underground thing to a lot I of startups the, i think the concept is out there but a lot of companies don't know where to start they don't know what to do and so when we start working with them you know again when you when you've been doing this a long time and you've learned in a lot of different categories, you can kind of pick and choose what's what's what and what matters. So one thing I did during the Great Recession back in 2008, 2009, again, my clients didn't have a huge budget to work with. Um, we couldn't do focus groups in multiple cities with different demographics, you know, the way that I could have done at P&G or Coke. And so we did what we call the listening tour. 
And, you know, you put together a bunch of questions. And, you know, if people had to go to a, a, a city for a meeting or a conference, we right. said, do you have time to have lunch or coffee? Can I ask you some questions? And we started asking all of our clients and prospective clients questions about how the Great Recession was affecting their business. And then after these trips, we'd come back to you know headquarters and reconvene and compare notes. And we learned a lot about how the Great Recession was affecting different categories, different industries. And I saw it with my own clients, you know, before the Great Recession, it was pretty common for people to hire us for these six figure engagements. But when the economy, you know, really uh, shrunk as a result of the crash, um, clients didn't have those budgets to spend anymore. So instead of maybe getting $100,000, a lot of things were capped at 20 or $25,000. So we had to repackage our offerings so that we could work in these discrete chunks and show a return on investment so that they would get enough value from a kind of marketing project that afterwards they could come back and say, wow, we learned a lot. Okay, now we want to try something else. What can you do with another twenty or 25000 so at the end of the year, they might have still spent 100000 but they didn't give us the budget at the beginning of the year. We had to earn it as we went. And mm -hmm. that was an important lesson that was really important. And it got us through the Great Recession. And guess what? It's been really useful during COVID too. So a lot of these things, you pick up, you learn, you tweak, and you just you know keep pivoting, keep learning. But you have to be, you, ha you have to keep your ear to the ground. You have to be aware that the market has moved. I mean, when you think about all the things that have changed in the last three years, all the habits, all the, you know, just, you know, where we work, how we work, what we wear to work, uh, how we vacation. I mean, when you think about the whiplash we've all been through over the last three years, um, if you don't ask your customers, if you don't, and it doesn't need to be expensive, you can do a Zoomerang or a Survey Monkey and send out the link to your list. Maybe you've got a list that you have for emails. Maybe you're part of a bunch of networking groups. You cast a wide net and, you know, I think the challenge again, if you don't know how to ask the questions properly in an objective way, you need to bring in experts that can help you because what mm -hmm. the one of the problems I've seen with with um, clients that have come to us, they say, oh, we've done all this um, research and people love our business. We don't understand why we're not making more money. And I said, oh, great. You've done research. Can I see it? And they said, well, we've just talked to a lot of people. And I said, great. What did you ask and who did you talk to? Well, guess what? They talk to their neighbor, their friend, their sister, their mother, their cousin. And that's not research. Asking your best friend what they love about your business, that doesn't count because A, they're not your target audience and B, they don't want to hurt your feelings. You've got to ask objective questions to the target audience with people that vote with their wallets because otherwise it's garbage in and garbage out. I, I think what's what's really important, which I'm picking up there, as well as obviously uh, sort of guerrilla marketing, the, uh, co the concept of testing and speed of implementation is your target, all, your target audience. Um, Mike and I have uh, spoken to many business owners and the target audience is invariably fairly broad really broad really broad um and yeah i mean i've not i, I mean the the phrase well i can coach um anybody or everybody it isn't an unknown phrase right we've all we've all heard that many many times so um really 
can the target audience be um, defined in a similar way? I mean, let's suppose that uh, with the startups back in the 90s and and you obviously fairly clear with the what I would call the marketing avatar, the, um, the client audience was 18 to um, 24, kind of skatey, may, uh, may, uh, may, uh, maybe a bit punk rocky. But if you're unsure of that, would there still have been uh, – is is there still a very important of maybe not just having uh, objective questions, but maybe tar uh, targeting two uh, two different groups, um, and maybe tar uh, targeting twenty five year olds to thirty twos with the young children, which presumably the result will be no uh, sort of I'm not interested. But if you don't ask them, and if you feel that 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 group from 18 to 32 are going to buy the same cd or listening to the same music or 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 whatever so what is your advice there uh, if we just take a step back and talk for a minute about the importance of finding and how to find one's uh, target audience yeah so it's really important to understand the buyer persona for your product or service and you know if you're a hotel there are a lot of different people that come stay at a hotel. They're business travelers, they're leisure travelers, they're families, they're weekend, you know, people yeah, that are young couples that are just want to get away for a weekend. They're not really taking vacations. They're people that really value spas or places that have more of a resort and restaurants and nightlife. So you've got to understand what it is about your product or service so that you can talk to that specific market in a way that makes them want to come and buy what you're selling. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of consultants out there and a lot of um, professional service firms, say wealth managers, financial managers, and, you know, like back to what you said, James, they could say, well, I can give anybody advice about their finances. Yeah. That doesn't really help because you're not being specific. And we helped a woman here uh, who was a wealth manager. And when we really dug in and did the, the research and talked to her audience and talked to her clients and really dug into where her sweet spot was it turns out her sweet spot was women who were going through a uh, financial windfall either because of death and inheritance or divorce like that was really who her core target audience was and once she realized like aha those are my best clients. They're my most loyal clients. They refer the most business to me. I can help them. Once she got that insight from the research, she changed all of her messaging, her website, her collateral material, her elevator pitch. So now, if you know a woman who just recently got divorced and got a nice alimony, or someone who maybe came into a windfall of money because their spouse or their parents died. Everybody was referring this woman to, like her name keeps coming up two, three, four times. Every time someone runs, one of her target audience runs into somebody, they say, mm -hmm. did you talk to Amy Smith? Because she's exactly the wealth manager you want to talk to. Like she owns that niche. So that's the yeah. real estate she owns in people's minds. And so everyone is is basically doing her marketing for her because she was so crystal clear on who her best audience was. That was her target market. So that's the benefit of being specific and really understanding at a granular level who is your best target. It, once mm. you do that, like the world conspires to get those people to beat down your door. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, uh, it reminds me, um, owning the space, owning the real estate space, owning the real estate space within your 
perfect client's mind. It uh, takes me back to that seminal book, um, Positioning, by Al Rees and uh, and uh, Jack Trout. I think it was 79, 80, 81. Um, but that that's pretty much um, um, what they were talking about then. And there was a famous phrase uh, even back then that um, oh about it about it being an overcrowded uh, kind of marketplace. I mean, I mean, and goodness knows um, what they what they would say now. But but it is so important that being so specific and having that uh, even a basic understanding of positioning to own that real estate uh, that that uh that part of real estate uh, within your your perfect client's mind isn't it well it it builds your brand it builds trust it builds credibility i mean think about it when amazon launched they were the world's biggest bookseller and that is all they did it was the yeah. spot online where you will go to buy books and at that point you know, people weren't really buying stuff online. This was like the early days of e-commerce and, you know, the internet. And they asked you to give you give them your credit card number and shop for books. And they were building a relationship and building trust. And everybody started doing it. And Barnes and Noble and all those companies went out of business because you started to believe like, okay, I, they really are the, the world's biggest bookseller and it's easy and I order it and it shows up and, you know, that's great. Well, when they got that kind of box checked, then they started selling music. Remember, they were selling, you know, yeah. the CDs yeah. and DVD, audio DVDs and all of that. Okay. Every like every step you you trust them more you build a deeper relationship yeah. now i mean is there anything you wouldn't buy on amazon they didn't start being this mm. super marketplace but now you can buy jewelry you can buy food you can buy clothes mm. i mean you buy everything on amazon but that's not where they started and so i think it's important to understand you know who you are at your core build the relationship um build a trusted brand that you know people do uh have a re relationship with and then you expand your toehold once you you know once you start kind of picking up momentum then you can kind of stretch outside the boundaries you know, when I when I started Mavens and Moguls, I put a stake in the ground on marketing. I, you know, our tagline is because marketing matters. So, no matter what problem you know people had, if they if they had a marketing problem, I wanted them to come to me. The truth is, a lot of our clients we get in there, and they do have marketing problems, but they have a lot of other problems too. And we're all good business people because we've all had good experiences across, you know, a lot of us were general managers and, you know, have managed sales, marketing, you know, worked in uh, companies with that are kind of complicated uh, with profit and loss responsibility. And it, it's so interesting that people bring us in for marketing we do a great job on the marketing project. And then while we're in the company, we'll say, you know, this over here, there's an opportunity to maybe streamline your sales organization or, you know, your project mm -hmm. management system could actually be improved. But now that they trust us and they know that they, they've they gotten great advice in one area, they're going to listen to you in other areas too. So don't try and boil the ocean. You can't start with everything. Start with what your sweet spot is. Start at your core. Uh, what you know? What are you better at than anybody else? And then once you kind of lock in for that, then you can start to expand. But don't expand too early. Yeah, uh, uh, I mean there are, there will be so many great points to uh, to uh, to um, unpack there, but. Well, I think trust. I mean, trust is huge um, nowadays, yes. uh, and uh, and I think. I mean, I know I keep returning to the basics here, but I think the uh, basics are obviously the foundation 
of um, everything. But but really, I mean, let's suppose that I was a wealth manager or a, a coach, and I could coach um, divorced uh, men over fifty, um, uh, twenty-five year olds dating issues, women over forty wanting to make. And maybe regain fitness after sort of <laughs> having children. I obviously could, or or not me, but a capable person can do can service a um a um a, a diverse uh, client base. But I think what what's really important, and uh, going back to your story of kind of the punk rocky kids sort of on the Santa Monica uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of, I mean, beachfront is that if you talk the language and kind of look the look, that that trust is gained at a deeper level. I mean, if I go in and and uh, and need an orthopedic operation uh, and the and the consultants just sort of there in kind of a grubby T-shirt and and uh, I mean, it's a very, very um, different impression to someone looking a bit more like a like a consultant who um, specialises in the shoulders or knee or, or whatever the. So, so it's so important, isn't it, that that it really starts from that knowledge of your client, and then so many things can sort of sort of sort of stem out of that, including um, um, build, uh, building trust at a much deeper level, right? No question. So the third startup I worked for was Zipcar, which um, was nobody knew what it was when I started. And now it's over a billion dollar business. They went public. They're everywhere. But when I started, they were only in just in one part of Boston. It was a really tiny company. And um, what's so interesting, you know, I had no marketing budget and I had no marketing department. Um, so when I started after coming from Coke and Procter and Gamble, uh, my budget for Zipcar when I started was a thousand dollars per city per month. And when I started, we were only in Boston. Then we expanded to Washington DC. Then we expanded to New York city. So with three cities, I had $3,000 a month, which, I don't need to tell you for media and advertising and marketing in New York, Boston and DC was nothing, nothing. But I had these cars that people could reserve and drive. Um, and I had a network of members who joined Zipcar to be part of our network. So I didn't have currency in the traditional sense, like green dollars, but the currency I had was driving credit. And I had, you know, our first, I don't know, call it 500 or a thousand members who had just started using the cars. And so I reached out to the network of drivers and there were all these events happening all over town. Um, and I couldn't personally attend all the events because, you know, I like I said, I had like an intern, or a part-time person. So I asked the, the Zipcar members if I could bring them into my marketing team. And I said, for every hour you work for me, um, I'll give you an hour of driving credit. And what I need is, you know, over the summer in Boston, there are lots of like festivals uh, on the weekends uh, in the Italian neighborhood, every weekend is like a feast or a festival. Uh, in Harvard Square, they have stuff, you know, all the time on the weekends and Oktoberfest and farmers markets. There's all kinds of activities. So I asked the Zipcar members, if you're available, could you take one of the cars to the event and get some helium balloons and stick it on the car? and stand there and you know uh you can pass out postcards which i could get printed for basically free online and answer questions if people want to learn about zipcar and you know tell them you're a member and tell them you know how it works and people loved it and i had people in the network who were drivers who worked at ad agencies and i said 
Could you do a logo? Could you put, you know, do some t-shirts or whatever? So I had all these members who are working as part of my marketing department, going to the activities, bringing cars, passing out postcards, designing swag and whatever. And at the end of each month, they drive for 10 hours, but then they worked for me for 10 hours. So they were basically using the car for free. But they thought it was great because they didn't have to pay to have a car. I thought it was great because I didn't have any money and I could pay them with driving credit. So you have to use the currency you have. And at the end of the day, it ended up being brilliant because can you imagine going to a street festival walking up to a car with balloons and it looks kind of like, hey, what's going on here? And you stop and you start asking questions. And then the person says, yeah, but you just do marketing for them. I mean, how can I believe you? And they're like, no, I actually don't do, like, I actually have a day job. I'm a Zipcar member. I'm doing this on my free time. And yeah. I, let me tell you how I use it. I use it for work. I use it for social you know, here are the cars that I like. This is the way it works for my life. So we got so many new members and it was so mm. credible. Again, building trust and building that relationship. It wasn't me, the hired gun mouthpiece, trying to tell them join Zipcar. It was a fellow member saying, oh my God, I live in this neighborhood. This is one of the cars I rent all the time. I use this car. It's so great. Let me tell you why. Here's how it works. No, you know, that's not a problem. You know, that used to be a problem. They got it fixed. But they're being very authentic and they're being very straight talking. I didn't give them talking points. I didn't tell them what to say. But they love doing it because they love the brand. They love the business. It was novel at the time. You know, it was brand new. And it ended up being like one of the smartest things we did to grow the business. All these ideas, it's really starting at grassroots, isn't it? Absolutely. That's guerrilla marketing. Yeah. I mean, that is the name of the game. You start with what you have and yeah. you just go from there. Beautiful. You do, you know, it's it like I said, it's a luxury to have big budgets and not have to kind of scrap, you know, scrap and yeah. save and whatever. But there's so many ways, you know, buying someone a cup of coffee or a, a sandwich for lunch, asking a few open-ended questions, and then just sit back and listen, take notes. That yeah. is great market research. It's not statistically significant, you know, but you might start hearing some trends. You know, you do it every you, once a week. You say, I'm going to take a customer or a prospect to lunch. And after two, three, five, ten lunches, all of a sudden you see some themes start to emerge. And then they say something and you say, okay, you know, I've heard that before. Why do you say that? What about that? What if we did this? What if we did that? So it becomes like a learning experience. Wow. You have just given all of our listeners the keys to the kingdom. Just <laughs> so many great lessons on marketing and interacting with people and just fantastic. With your clients, particularly early stage companies, what are some of the common mistakes you see them making? So, you know, we live in a world, I think if we've learned anything during COVID, it's that your online presence really matters. You do not exist today if you if people can't find you online and before you meet with someone before you return their phone call before you schedule an appointment what do you do you go to google and you type in their name and i don't know mike with a name like yours and a name like mine when you type in the name it's probably really us and uh, yeah. <laughs> what what yeah. comes back um is important because that's your brand. And if there's some digital dirt out there on you, it's going to pop up. And so you need to know what it is out there that you're attached to. And if you don't like it, you better start cleaning it up. And I always tell my clients, like, 
You know, people think, oh, on LinkedIn, I'm very professional, but on Twitter, I want to be snarky or on Facebook, I want to be kind of cool. And, you know, a lot of young people, they go on spring break, they get kind of into parties and they post pictures. Here's the problem with that. Again, back to building a trusted and consistent brand. If you're one way on one platform and another way on another platform and a third way on a different platform, people don't know what version of you is going to show up at mm -hmm. the meeting or yeah, if yeah. they're looking to hire you, like, is the professional person going to show up? Is the snarky person going to show up? Is the yeah. heavy drinker going to show up? So you really need to think of yourself as a brand. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people say to me all the time, but, you know, I'm not LeBron James. I'm not Taylor Swift. I'm not really a brand. The truth is everybody's a brand and in your world you are a brand and if you don't define yourself other people are going to define you instead so yeah. you need to take control of what's out there and think long and hard about the one two maybe three things you want to stand for and be known for you can't stand for everything so what are the two or three words that you want people to think of when they think of you and make sure those are in your profiles. That's what you're talking about on your blog. That's what you're tweeting about. That, that's what you're posting about on LinkedIn. Those are the keywords that you're using. You need to tie mm -hmm. it all together and make sure that you're building a consistent brand and a trusted brand because otherwise, you know, people, like I said, if you don't exist online, you don't exist. And if you're confusing or you dilute your brand online, it's just a wasted opportunity and a big mistake. Wow. 100%. 100%. Well, um, what is the best way for people to get a hold of you? So the two best things you can do is go to my website, mavensandmoguls.com. It's M-A-V-E-N-S-A-N-D mogulscom or you can find me on LinkedIn and it's my name all smushed together no hyphen p-a-i-g-e-a-r-n-o-f-f-e-n-n -E -E -N -N. but as one of my clients said she couldn't remember both names of my company she couldn't remember my hyphenated last name all she remembered was Paige and Mavens and she put it in Google and I popped right up. So thank God for search engine optimization. It works. So if you forget everything, just yeah. Google page and Mavens and you'll find me. It's really me. Fantastic. All right, encourage everybody reach out to Paige with your marketing and branding questions. Yeah. Don't, uh, don't hesitate. Just reach out. She's really easy to talk to, as you can tell. <laughs> you well, thanks so much. Course, uh, any final words for us, Paige or James? I, I've had a ball. This has been great. I hope your listeners have learned a few things, and I hope I've convinced them that marketing and branding is fun, but it's really important. One of my professors in business school used to say, marketing is everything, and everything is marketing. And I used to laugh, but now that I've been doing this forever, I think he was right. I think it's true. I don't know, James, do you agree? Absolutely, absolutely. Being because uh, ultimately marketing is is how we make our business grow, and uh, and I'd really like to thank you um, so much, Paige. Um, what for me has been so uh, just a brilliant combination has been your experience of that grassroots and that guerrilla marketing, and how maybe you 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 were started. You started uh, imp uh, implementing that 25 years ago, uh, whereas it's so re it's so relevant now. We do not need a million dollar um, startups. Do not need a million bucks to find their perfect client uh, uh, and and really find some some uh, keywords for marketing and uh, people's opinions. So th thank you so much. Really, really, in uh, really invaluable uh sort of in the trenches uh advice there so thank you so much well it's been a, it's been really fun for me too thanks so much for having me